The title of uh, what I'm going to speak about today is a call to personal diligence and uh, I've also been observing the news and experiencing some of the trepidation and uh, the urgency of the times in which we live and it, it, again it's a call to personal diligence. We need to be aware and we need to be awake. To what's happening don't keep your eyes closed and we go down to basics and I looked at some of the proverbs I want to go through some of the proverbs and I'm going to give something fairly basic firstly we go to Proverbs 22 Proverbs 22 and that's going to be repeated in Proverbs uh, let's see this is going to be repeated in Proverbs 27 12 but we'll go to Proverbs 22 and verse 3 which applies to us today as we observe as we look at what's going on, uh, cities being blocked off, uh, the, the, the authorities uh, being ignored and even challenged and even sentenced to uh, prison. Proverbs 22.3, as we observe, a prudent one foresees the evil and hides himself, but the thoughtless plough ahead and are punished. And the same thing in Proverbs 27 and verse 12. Uh, again, it's repeated twice. A prudent man foresees the evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. A few more Proverbs. Uh, we'll go back to Proverbs 26. And, you know, we need to be careful. Watch one one needs to watch oneself. We need to watch ourselves that we do not allow ourselves to be deceived because the heart is deceitful above all things. That's true. Who can know it? We've got to be alert. And Proverbs 26 and verse 13. The lazy one says, There is a lion in, this, in the way. Yea, a lion in the streets and if we read on to verse 14 it says as the door now this is the description that uh, can be easily f uh, how can we say S uh, you can easily fall into this frame of mind uh, be not deceived God is not mocked whatsoever a man sows he will reap and it goes on as the door pretty simple it's, it's so easy to read and to comprehend and understand, yet it is a fact of the way we are, the state we can fall into. As the door turns upon its hinges, so does the lazy man turn upon his bed. And you know, there is it's a, a very interesting uh, experiment in science way back in my school days. A frog is basically cold-blooded. It, it's, it's, um, its temperature changes. And a frog can actually be put into a pot of cold water and boiled. And the frog will not, as the water even boils, the, the frog will not apparently jump or, or complain in any way by its actions until it dies. It just stays there. And it's, it is an apt uh, uh, comparison. And on to Proverbs 20. We all need to be diligent and not allow ourselves to be deceived by the natural deceptive heart that we are given. And I wonder, I wonder, I wonder why God has given us this kind of a uh, potential flaw. And... Perhaps the Father in Christ, after the rebellion of the, the greatest that he could make, analysed it and, and, and saw that this was the state that the great light bringer changed to the rebel, Satan, fell into. And indeed, a third of the angels fell into this state. 
So Proverbs 20 verse 13. Do not love sleep, lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you shall be satisfied with bread. It's easy to fall asleep. It's easy to go astray. Apparently, the way our hearts are made. And if we look at Genesis, let's go to Genesis 19 and verse 1. Now, I also have been observing what has been happening. How could it be that whole city blocks are, are just cornered off and, and they will loot stores, do whatever they want, lawlessness and woe to anyone that comes in this area trying to establish, shall we say, law and order. The police, obviously, have been under attack as well. Now, th this is what comes to mind for me. Genesis 19 and verse 1. Now, though the sin is different here, uh, I wonder. The principle, however, remains the same. What has happened and what is happening is reminiscent of another time in history. Genesis 19 verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot arose to meet them, and when he saw them, he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. Verse 2. And he said, Behold, now my lords, Please turn into your servant's house and stay all night and wash your feet and you shall rise up in the early morning and go your way. He knew what was going on outside in the town. He did not want them to stay outside. And they said, no, but we will stay in the street. But he urgently pressed them and they turned into him and entered into his house. Okay. And he made them a feast, baked unleavened bread. Gives you an idea of the time, unleavened bread. And they ate. But before they lay down, okay, the word got out. These new guys got in there. Is this, again, the prince of the power of the air that moved these people to again, surround the house. They surrounded the house, both young and old, and all the people, all the, all the, uh, uh, it's difficult to get past that one, all the people from every quarter. Verse 5, And they called to Lot, and they said to him, Where are the men who came into you this night? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Wow. Let's go to Isaiah 3, Isaiah 3 and verse 9. It's pretty evident the decadence of that time and, and surrounding the area, right? That's what came to mind or comes to mind as I observe personally what goes on in the news. Isaiah 3 and we'll go to verse 9. It's, it's reminiscent uh, also of Revelation 11, 8. We'll go to that after that because that brings it into the present. Isaiah 3 and verse 9. The look, of their, the look of their faces witnesses against them and they declare their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to their soul for they have rewarded evil to themselves. Okay, we're looking at Sodom in a future tense here. And if we look at 11, uh, Revelation 11 and verse 8. Now this refers to the two, is referring to the two witnesses. And their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually is called, okay, this is future. Revelation 11, verse 8, is called Sodom. Why? Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now here, I, I, I personally am going through the US and Britain in prophecy booklet again, emphasizing, uh, looking at it, understanding 
who this refers to. And if we go to Romans uh, chapter 1, verse 22, okay, uh, is, is this far-fetched? I ask a question. Imagine if you were to go to one of those uh, crowded, blocked-off uh, city squares there or uh, city blocks that are, that are actually barricaded with these people and, you know, come out with a Romans 122 and speak to them. Try and talk some sense to them and say, hey, look, while professing themselves, this is it. This is, this is the facts. God's revealed knowledge about conduct, about life, the way he made us. Try and talk some sense into those people. Imagine, and I, I, I saw one clip where uh, a lady attacked someone that was trying to film, and it was actually one of theirs. While professing themselves to be wise ones, they became fools, verse 23, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the likeness of an image of a corruptible man and of birds and four-footed creatures and creeping things. You know, today, today what happens? We believe, we're taught that life is just spontaneous. That's it. A spontaneous generation is an explanation of creation without a creator. There is no God. So that's today, the teachings that we have in mind. Okay, verse 24, for this cause, because of these idols in our minds, what has been taught in this generation, God's not in their hearts, nor is the fear of God in them. For this cause, verse 24, God also abandoned them to uncleanliness through the lusts of their hearts to disgrace themselves, to disgrace their own bodies between themselves. Verse 25, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and they worshipped the served and uh, the created. Okay, dumb stupidity has made us. We're so complex. We, we, we can produce such incredible marvels of machinery, flight, uh, technology. Yet, we, who are so capable, made so capable, have been made by dumb stupidity. So, disorder creates harmony. Okay, served and created, uh, the, the created thing more than the one who is creator, who is blessed into the ages. Amen. Verse 26, for this cause God abandoned them to disgraceful passions, for even their women change their natural use of sex into that which is contrary to nature. And the same men are also men, having left their natural use of sex with the woman, were inflamed in their lustful passions towards one another. Men with men, shamelessly committing lurid acts and receiving back within themselves a fitting penalty for their error. Verse 28, in sickness and disease. Verse 28, and in exact proportion as they did not consent to have God because of this conduct, they did not consent to have God in their knowledge. And God, as a result, abandoned them to a reprobate mind to practice those things that are immoral. Let's look at Isaiah 3. Isaiah 3. Now, because of this, because of unrepentant sin, this is what concerned me so much, watching what is going on. God will take away the security for correction. Isaiah 3, and we'll start in verse 1. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, takes away from Jerusalem and from Judah, his people, the stay in the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water, the man of might, 
Okay, this is what this is what's happening. Our defenses of where we are. This is what we're observing, and and this is why. The man of might and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the diviner and the ancient, the captain of fifty. As it says, I will break the pride of your power. The captain of fifty and the honourable man and the advisor, the whole gamut of society and the cunning charmer and the skillful enchanter. Verse 4, and I will give young lads to be their princes and capricious children shall rule over them. And we see again a picture of city blocks being uh, corned off and barricaded by what? By such as we are reading here and they cannot be challenged and they will not be challenged. Verse 5 and the people shall be crushed every man by another and every man by his neighbour. The young shall rise up against the old and the base against the honourable. And if we look at verse, we get down to verse 9, the look of their faces witnesses against them and they declare again the reference. They declare their sin like Sodom. Can you imagine standing in a crowd like that and trying to tell them what's right or wrong? They would basically overtake you and uh, knock you down. They do not hide it. Woe to their soul for they have rewarded evil to themselves. You know, are, are these demonstrations that we see that they're, they're an eruption of society, the thinking of society, it is a, a, a natural reaction. And we even, in Australia, we even have it in uh, Sydney and uh, I can't believe it. it <laughs> these, these dem what's going on? Uh, are these demonstration uh, amongst humble people or are they haughty people? What is the attitude? Verse 12, as for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. Oh, my people, those who lead you cause you to err and destroy the way of your paths. Let's go to Ezekiel 18. Things get worse. They don't get better. Now, Things can go either way, for us, for you, for me. Each of us gets to decide our own destiny. Now we're going to look at a, a microcosm, a more individual, a view of the heart, the individual. Again, each of us gets to decide which way our destiny. Ezekiel 18 and verse 19, cutting in there, Yet you say, why? Does not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? And when the Son has done that which is lawful and right, and has kept all my statutes, and has done them, he shall surely live. Verse 20. It says, the soul that sins, the individual is responsible for making a decision. We are to ensure that we're not deceived. We shall be accountable, everyone for themselves. The soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, nor shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked turn again and it continually repeats and repeats this, this uh, truth, this principle of judgment that God uses, but if the wicked will turn from all his sins which he has committed and keep my statutes. Now, I just think today we are drawn. God gives us a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. Ezekiel 26, 36 is the reference there. And then again in the, in the church, in 2 Corinthians 3, 3, I'll quote the scripture. We need, need not go there. Uh, the law is not on tablets of stone. 
but it's in the heart, in the very base of our foundation of our thinking, of our mind, of our being. And keep all my statutes, and keep all my statutes, it says, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Verse 22, all his transgressions that he has done, they shall not be mentioned to him. In his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. It's an individual calling and an individual matter here. Now, verse 23, this is God's heart. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Says the Lord God, is it not pleasing instead that he should turn from his ways and live? That's, that makes sense. I mean, this is, God is reasoning with us. This is what I want. Understand it. Verse 24, but when the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits, even if we are right, you know, and, and, and I think about it, I mean, well, can we all identify with this? How many were there amongst us? How many were they? And, and, and where are they? Surely some are in uh, uh, obedient uh, uh, churches that are spiritual. But the great numbers that we had. I remember th there was a big excitement when we got up to 144,000. Is this the 144,000? It was, it was just basically the, the overall number in the uh, Worldwide Church of God. Uh, but where are they? There were those that were amongst us that understood the same things, that heard the same messages, and yet I think we can all identify with names and faces and past friends who we shared the truth with. Where are they? They are not around anymore. I'll read verse 24 again. But when the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked do back into the world, shall he live? That's the question. All his righteousness that he has done shall not, shall not, shall not be remembered because of his trespass that he has trespassed and because of his sin that he has sinned. Because of them he shall die. Verse 25. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not fair. Well, that's not fair. Here now, O house of Israel, O house of Israel, O house of Israel. Sometimes we just can't get past certain words. Who is this being directed to? The house of Israel, the descendants. I just, I'll mention the book just in case um, this comes out on a CD, obviously. If, if there's anyone that has not read the book U.S. and Britain in Prophecy, I advise you to write in for it and get a hold of it and read it. And as a matter of fact, it bears reading again and remembering again. Here now, house of Israel, is, n is not my way fair? Are not your ways unfair? When a righteous one turns away from his righteousness, it continues and commits iniquity and dies because of it. For his iniquity that he has done, he shall die. And it's reminiscent of Matthew 25. What does it say? There were ten virgins. Five were wise and five were foolish. Is this an actual percentage? Or, 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 or does the five that reflects mercy means that some received mercy and some didn't? But the bottom line is that there were ten what? Virgins. Ten who understood and knew. I think that is a, that is a scripture that should make us all really think. And as I say, this is a call to personal diligence to make sure your house is not on fire. 
verse 27. Uh, no, we'll go to we'll go to verse 31 now. Cast away from you. This is, we've got to be in a continual heart and mind and state of repentance, and, and and that's the only way we won't be deceived. To continually, day by day, seek God in prayer, in study, refill uh, th those spiritual tanks, be spiritually alive, alert, aware ready for anything cast away from you that's the process a daily process all your transgressions by which you have transgressed and make a new uh, and make you a new heart and a new spirit for why why will you die this is god inspiring these words to us to you to me why why will you die o house of Israel, for I have no delight in it, uh, no delight in the death of him who dies, says the Lord. Therefore, turn, and that is a daily requirement. Turn yourselves and live. Next, I ask a question: Is this a parable for today? Um, let's go to Revelation 18, verse three. With, with what I've just said in mind, I'm going to go and I'm going to look at the lessons or some of the lessons from the life of Samson. Um, Samson is going to be in the company of King David and uh, Samuel, righteous men, men that will be in the first resurrection. So the firstborn, they're going to be in the, the, the category of the firstborn and that, is that not the category that we aim for, that we seek to be the, amongst the firstborn? And uh, let's see, we're going to Revelation 18. And before that, uh, Revelation 17, we read about a harlot, a great harlot sitting on many waters, spiritual fornication, it's a warning for us today. And in type, uh, you know, the life of Samson, he should have known better. He should have understood not to keep the company of a harlot. And likewise, the lessons are there for us today. And the lesson is that God's power is conditional. God's love is can, well, in a sense, conditional to what we do, how we live, if we obey, if we are close to him. That let's not make any mistake. His power, his favor, his strength can indeed leave you and leave me if we turn aside from the way. Revelation 18 verse 3. Because all nations have drunk of the wine of the fury of her fornication, her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Now there's the comparison on the macrocosm. With her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the power of her luxury. Verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, and this is a message to us. Today, those who are called, the first called, to be in the first resurrection, the first fruits. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you do not partake or take part in her sins, and that you do not receive of her plagues. We go down to verse 9. Again, the kings of the earth who have committed fornication with her down to the present and have lived luxuriously will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning okay Samson's story let's go to Judges 16 and we'll start in verse 15 Judges 16 Samson's story a parable for us today certainly there are principles there that should serve, that must serve as a warning 
he was caught in the snare of a harlot. Now we understand the symbolism, the spiritual symbolism of the harlot. He knew, he must have known it was wrong. Must have known it. Yet there were pains from the past and hurts. And he, he probably thought, well, God will understand. He must understand this. So basically he took God's power and strength and promises that he'd made for granted. And this applies on the individual level to us. And later on, uh, we'll go into the application of a national level. And there, if I had a cowbell, I would ring it. Judges 15, 16, verse 15. And she said to him, how can you say... Now, this is after three times. How can you say, I love you, and your heart is not with me? I love you. I love you. And your heart is not with me. You have mocked me these three times and have not told me in what your great strength lies. I mean, how dumb. Every time, every time he told her a lie, the Philistines came in. Did he ever think, I mean, I don't know what was in Samson's head, but there was a, a weakness, right? We must not have a spiritual weakness. How many times are we warned of what is to be? of this spiritual harlot, of this society, being a part of it. We are, we are, as it says, we are in the world, but we should not be of the world. Okay, we go to verse 16. Three chances. He was given three chances. Three. Three reveals. And it's a continual choice for us, isn't it? We need to continually make choices as we see events unfold, as circumstances basically erupt around us. Do we need to take heed? Do we take heed? This is what I ask myself. Verse 16, and it came to pass because she distressed him. You hang out, you know, you hang out so long, then you're gonna you're gonna cave in. Distressed him with her words daily and urged him, and his soul was grieved to death. Yo, know, again, we've got to choose. Three strikes and you're out, Samson. Verse 17, and he told her all his heart, and he said to her, A razor has not come upon my hair, for I am a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will go from me. If we are pulled away from that contact, that, that daily eating and drinking, eat and drink spiritually, let's not make any mistake. We're done. That's, we don't have God's protection, strength, power, mind, heart with out any con it's con well it is conditional that we must seek we must draw close to God on a daily basis basis and more so as we see the day approach so he told her and what happens verse 18 and Delilah when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines saying come this once for he sh he's done it who showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and gave her the brass, <laughs> the silver in their hands they brought. Verse 19, and she made him sleep. I mean, you know, this reflects as a parable of the five foolish virgins. How silly can you be? She made him sleep, look at this, upon her knees. And she called for a man. She had it all organized. Called for a man and he caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she and probably gave him a bit of wine so he slept also. That's just a perhaps. So he, to make sure she could do a good job. And she began to afflict him and his strength went from him. Verse 20. And she said, 
The Philistines are upon you, Samson, just like before. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. And we should not take it for granted that God can depart from you. He can depart from me. He can be, depart from us. Verse 21, And the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, put out his eyes. There's some symbolism there. And brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did, and he did grind grain in the prison house. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Okay, so he's, he was blinded. And then he was not tempted. He couldn't see anymore. The sight of the, the harlot is what basically imprisoned him. And it cost him... It ended up costing him his life. Now the comparison here is to God's church at his return. Revelation 3 verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these. This is the time just before Christ returns. This is a time when we see the world erupt. Right? Five wise, five foolish. We need to be awake. This is a call to personal diligence. Write these things to the church of the Laodiceans. Write these things, says, the, says, says he, amen, the, the amen, faithful and true witness and the beginner of the creation of God. I know your works. Does God know our spiritual state? I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, I would that you were either cold or hot. That's what he wants, in or out. Verse 16, So then because you are lukewarm, sort of a bit hot and a sort of a bit cold, the point is we have to decide. And are neither cold nor hot. I will spew you out of my mouth. Verse 17, For you say I am rich, and I've become wealthy and have need of nothing. Do we justify spiritual poverty? We need to, do we need to fast and pray and seek God's Spirit? Do we have an abundance of God's Spirit? And you do not, if you're in that state, we can fall in that state again. The heart is deceitful above all things. And you do not understand that you are wretched, miserable, poor, Blind and naked. Naked. That's a reference to having the garments, the garments, the spiritual garments that come from God. And this is the counsel, verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold, character, purified by fire, fiery trials. You know, either we seek God with all our hearts or we're put into the fire where we will seek God with all our hearts so that you may be rich in white garments, so that you may be clothed spiritually with, with character, with the uh, character of God. And the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and to anoint your eyes, the eyes, remember Samson, your eyes with eye salves, so that you may see. Let's look at Daniel 12. Go to Daniel 12. Now here... This can apply also at a national level. Now, if I had a cowbell, this is where I would ring it. This is just something that I personally have been thinking about, and I wonder. There were three warnings. And, okay, this is just speculation on my part that I share with you. In 1980, a king was raised up, and his name was Reagan. We had a Soviet empire that was threatening that, that basically wanted to go into the Middle East, right? So what happened? They backed down. Uh, and it wasn't during Reagan's time, I know, but because he was a strong king, shall we say. Now, 
That was number one. Number two, 2020, there's another king. And we look at the major nation of Israel, obviously the United States. And there's another king, and, uh, and uh, let's see, there's another economic power, a Chinese economic power that's being challenging. Now, so again, this is to do with the modern descendants of Joseph, the descendants of Ephraim, that is the remnants of the British Commonwealth, and Manasseh, America. Again, I, if, it, is, uh, it is good to, if you have not, whoever listens to this after has not read the book, US and Britain in Prophecy, do read it. So, okay, do we come to the, let's look at Daniel 12 and verse 7. So it's three times, we've, we've got two, three times. What happens? Is the time of Daniel 12 and verse 7 ahead of us? Daniel 12, verse 7, And I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and left hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever, saying, It shall be for a time and times and half a time, and when the power, the power, here it is, and when the power of the holy people, this is prophetic and a specific time in history, and about a people that have a power, has finally been broken. All these things shall be finished. Uh, verse 8, And I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Okay, let's look at verse 4. Let's get a hint of the setting of the time setting but you O Daniel go back to verse 4 shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end the time of the end the time of the end many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased well Matthew 24 22 today let's look at Matthew 24 22 today motorized air, sea, land travel, space travel, nuclear. Only today, knowledge has been increased like never before. Only perhaps that we have no knowledge of uh, before the flood. Matthew 24, 22. And if those days, this is the description of today. If those days, these days, had not been limited, there would be no flesh saved alive or saved but for the elect's sake those days shall be limited and mark 13 verse 20 this is, is a call to diligence these are the times we are living in today we cannot afford to fall asleep at the wheel we need to keep our spiritual hearts and eyes open as we see these things unfold, Matthew 13, 20 says the same thing. And unless the Lord had limited the days, no flesh, no flesh, that's how bad it will get, would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, whom he has the elect. And, and what happened if you find one righteous person, Lot, just one, God would not destroy Sodom. So it is for the elect, right? The sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has limited the days. Let's go to Isaiah 33. It is a, Isaiah 33. It describes a time of war, of social breakdown and distress. Isaiah 33, verse 7. Behold, their mighty ones shall cry outside. The messengers of peace shall weep bitterly. This is the state of affairs that we are going into. Why we need to be diligent. Verse 8, the highways lie waste. The traveller cease. Talk about economic shutdown. There is much, much worse to come. He has broken the covenant. He's despised the cities. He cared for no man. Verse 9, the earth mourns languishes, Lebanon is ashamed, Sharon withers away like a wilderness, and so on. Uh, verse 10, now, this is the time setting. Now I will arise, now 
says the Lord. Now I will be exalted. Now I will lift myself up. It's a time of utter destruction. Let's go to Ezekiel 12. Ezekiel 12. So this is the time just before when Christ returns, when destruction looms, when Satan, <clears throat> similar to uh, the destruction, similar to the destruction that Satan brought, he's by his rebellion, where the earth became tohu and bohu, lifeless, waste and, and void and empty. And there was not even any light. God had to create light first recreate life, clear the atmosphere. Ezekiel 12. Okay, so the choice of the path is before you and before me. It's before us now. We need to choose the path continually. Ezekiel 12 and verse 22. Son of man, what is this proverb that you have concern, concerning the land of Israel, saying the days are prolonged and the every vision shall fail? Ain't going to happen. This is not going to happen. Verse 27, Son of man, behold, the house of Israel says the vision that he sees is for many days to come, and he prophesies of times that are afar off. Okay. Looks like a little bit like uh, we need to avoid Samson putting off, drawing close to God, repenting. Uh, God had been with him, he's with us in a powerful way. And, and you know, he was strengthened, we're strengthened. But we have to beware of spiritual sleep and spiritual, that leads to spiritual fornication. You know, God's mercy is extended only for a time though. It's meant for us to repent and to continue repenting and be in that state of mind. Verse 28, Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord God, there shall none of my words be delayed any more. The time will come, but the word which I have spoken shall be done. They who say, peace, peace and sudden destruction shall come upon them. We know it will happen all of a sudden, says the Lord God. Now, I'm going to go forward here. Let's go to Luke 18. Luke 18. And let's take a snapshot of uh, perhaps the five virgins and the other five virgins, the wise and the foolish. Luke 18 and verse 10. This is the attitude that we should have and this is the attitude that we should not have. Luke 18 verse 10, two men went into the temple to pray and the one was a Pharisee and the other one a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and prayed with, him, with, him, with, 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 with himself in this manner, God I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unrighteous, adulterers or even as this tax collector. I fast twice in the week, man. <laughs> We can be overly self-righteous. And even if we think we're close to God, is one close to God? Well, this is what this parable will tell us. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of everything I gain. And the tax collector, the tax collector, this is the heart of the repentant this is the heart that we need to have every day. Tax collector standing afar off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat himself on the chest saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the Greek implies the sinner. Verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. This attitude, this outlook, day to day, repenting, humble, rather than the other, for everyone. Here's the principle. Everyone who exalts himself, and do we not have to seek not to exalt ourselves every day because we still retain and have that heart of stone and not the heart of flesh. It is a battle, a continual battle. If we're righteous, 
or if we, we can become unrighteous. And you know who God favours. For everyone who exalts himself or herself shall be humbled, and the one who humbles, that's a principle, humbles himself, humbles herself, shall be exalted. And if we go to Isaiah 1, chapter 18, this is, this is God's outlook. You know, how does he view our weaknesses? How does he look at it? Isaiah 1, and we go to verse 18. Come now, let us reason together. God wants to reason with us. And says the Lord, though your sins are as scarlet, and we do miss the mark at times, but we need to remember this is what our Creator turns and speaks to us about and communicates with us. They shall be as white as snow, no matter what. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Now let's go to Revelation 18. Revelation 18. And what is the counsel that God gives us? Look at verse 4. Hey, Revelation 18 verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. This is the instruction we're given today. Do not be like the parable of the life of Samson. Come out, come out, he says. Come out of her, my people, so that you do not part take in or uh, take part in her sins, and that you do not receive her plagues. Okay, here's another instruction to us. Joel two verse twelve. Let's go to Joel two verse twelve. We can't stay there and be like the proverbial Samson. We've got to get out and continually come out of this world, its ways, the jobs, the money. The, the, the things of the world. There's always hope while there is time. And that's the message to us. Joel 2 verse 12. Then even now, says the Lord, turn, turn to me every day with all your heart. It doesn't matter if you're strong today. You can't be weak tomorrow. You've got to be strong, close to God, day by day by day. Turn to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping. Two men went into the temple to pray. And with mourning, yes, rend your hearts, not your garments, not external. And return to the Lord your God for he's gracious. That's his nature. Hey, you can rely on me. That's what he's saying. Gracious and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness and he repents he repents of evil so revelation let's go to revel well I, i'm going to move forward here i'm going to move forward here a little bit we and you, you know when i remember uh, at, at a time when i was uh, drawing close to god when i started coming along uh, I remember way back in 1973, the Yom Kippur War in the Middle East. And uh, things are really happening then. And, oh, you know, I, I would go into Isaiah 58 1. And uh, I'll just go to Isaiah 58. 58 and verse 1. Cry aloud. Do not spare. Lift up your voice like a ram's horn and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and seek eager to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and as one that did not forget the ordinance of their God. Well, you know, where are you, I would say? <laughs> I was seeking God. Uh, I was just new. I was looking. Where are you? And this is what I would continually read. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. Yes, that's what I was doing personally. It, 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 it's personal to me. And they seem eager to, to draw near to God. And they say, why have we fasted and you don't see? Why have we afflicted our soul and you do not take knowledge? Behold, the day of your fast, you pursue your own business and exploit all your workers. You fast for strife. For debate, you argue, you strike with a fist of wickedness. We need to understand. I thought, I need to understand where I do this. Stop it. Repent. And I'd ask God to show me. 
I mean, I, I pass this on to you. This is, this is something of my beginnings, but I, I was away, I had to get close, and I had to strive. Is such, verse 5, the fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul. Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush? Can you, can you imagine that? You know, a bulrush, a, a plant. It, it has no mind, no brain, no nothing. And that's the way God, it's a picture, the way God can look at us if we don't have the heart of repentance, the desire, the passion to draw close to God. Is it now... It, it, Verse 7, give your bread to the hungry. What does that mean? I had to think. We need to think. What does it mean? This is what we do. Bring home the wandering poor. Pour yourself out. Desire to do good with passion. And, and the result, verse 8, then your light shall break out as the dawn. Oh, that is what we desire on a daily basis. And your health shall spring out quickly and your righteousness shall go before you and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then the desire, then you shall call and the Lord shall answer. You shall cry and he'll shall say, he'll shall say here I am. That's what we want to hear all the time. If you take away the, the uh, if you take the yoke away from amongst you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking malice, and if you draw out your soul for the hungry. Well, I'm going to conclude here. You know, we, we started looking at Proverbs 26, and it says the lazy, verse 13, the lazy one says, there's a line, excuses. There's a line in the streets. Yeah, there's a, there's a line there. And verse 14, and you know, as the door turns on its hinges, we cannot be stuck in our ways. We have to rip those hinges apart, draw close to God, be different, know that we have got a deceptive heart. And if we go to Revelation 22 and verse 11, we must choose continually. This is a call Today, as we see these situations happen and the news unfold, it's a call for diligence. And we'll conclude with Revelation 22 and verse 11. At the end of the book, God ends this way with the same admonition. It's up to us to decide a personal call for diligence. Revelation 22, verse 11. Let the one who is, is not going to force you. It's up to you. It's up to me. It's up to us. Let the one who is unrighteous be unrighteous still. And let the one who is filthy be filthy still. And let the one who is righteous be righteous still. And let the one who is holy be holy still call to personal diligence as we see events unfold before our eyes especially. <music>